So yeah, I'm Kyle Anaker. As we said, this is why building um, components in Drupal is so difficult. The slides are available at tinyurl.com slash difficult components if you want to follow along on your laptops um, or sneak get a sneak preview of the ending. And then we'll go into introduction. So yeah, I'm Kyle Lineker, Senior Technical Architect at Proficient, which is a huge global digital agency. Um, we have like 7,000 employees spread across the globe. We do everything from Drupal, AEM, Sitecore, to like Microsoft Azure, pretty much anything in the technical space you can think of, we have somebody doing it. Um, but I'm a, a technical architect on the Drupal team there. I, sorry, I'm gonna adjust this. Um, been doing Drupal since 2014. I got started mostly as a back-end developer doing commerce um, and have slowly shifted to more of a full-stack architect type role and really kind of focus on more complex integration heavy sites now um, for, for big enterprises. I moved to Asheville from Chicago just over a year ago, which I have no regrets about. Asheville is an awesome city. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, especially because you know there's plenty of craft beer and hiking trails. So when I'm not working, I'm, I'm usually having a beer out hiking. And then I'm currently dog sitting two, two adorable puppers. Um, Molly's the big white one, and then Sparky's the small one, and they've been keeping my days busy um, and fighting off all the bears. All right, so first, I apologize. There's gonna be a lot of words on these slides. Um, I tried to cut it down and it just was not possible. I promise I'll try to address every point, so don't feel like you need to read all the words on the slide, but they are there for later reference if you come back to the presentation. Um, and we're gonna speed through a bunch of preamble, a kind of level setting of what is a component, what is a component system, what makes it successful, why do you want one, and then get into more of the meat of why it's hard in Drupal. So we're gonna kind of speed through the beginning here with kind of the assumption that you guys probably all have experience building components and all have opinions about why it's hard. Um, so first question, what is a component? So a component is a reusable piece of content on your site. It's a modular UI element. Um, importantly, it stores content, not data. If you've made the mistake of trying to store data in a component, you know that eventually it bites you um, because you're coupling your presentation layer with your data storage layer, and that's bad. Um, so yeah, don't, don't ever make the mistake of trying to store data in your components. Um, you don't want to be referencing or trying to filter a component list or creating a list of components. You really just want to be displaying content. Um, I like to think of it as the only thing Drupal cares about from a component is that it can get it on the page and render it correctly. If there's any more meaning to the, to the forms or the fields in your component, you're doing it wrong. Um, if you need to display data, then you should do that through a dynamic component that dynamically loads in your data from a field and then renders it out um, instead of collecting the data in the form or the field on the component itself. So another big part of it is that they can be embedded in other components or authored as content. Um, so they're reusable, they're modular, you can place them on a bunch of pages and they're all gonna look the same. Um, and one thing I don't think a lot of people realize that, is that the components in your site are probably the most highly structured piece of content you have in your site itself. Um, Twig templates are extremely fragile, and if you pass the wrong data to them, it will 500 your page. So I think it's just really important to remember that the level of scrutiny that you'd put into like a commerce catalog architecture needs to be put into your component architectures as well, because it's just as important and will bring your site down just as, just as easily. Um, yeah, it's just really important that you remember the, the structure of your component matters and changing it later can be difficult. So that's a component. Um, when you put a bunch of components together, you end up with a component system. And what does that mean, like, right? What is a component system? First, here's a task. We need a new battery for the drill. Which shop would you rather be doing that task in? The red one, yeah, raise the hands. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you don't, don't see it, there's three different drills for the one on the left. So the first question you have to ask is, what battery do I need a drill for? And what brand is that? Versus the one on the right is, all right, go, buy, go to the store and buy the red one. Um, and that's kind of the goal of a component system. You want to walk into a site or you want to start working on a site and be able to say, all right, this is how we're doing things. This is easy. I understand this. At a glance, I know I can work efficiently in the shop or in the site. 
Whereas the one on the left, sure, maybe they have the best tool of every brand or the best brand for every tool, but it's kind of chaos and you, you're not real confident that you know what you're looking for, you know what you need. So that's a pretty good analogy for kind of the goal of, of a component system. Look into it a little bit more detail. Um, first, don't confuse a component system with a design system. A design system um, is more for at the organization level. So it's about establishing brand guidelines. Um, it really needs C-level sponsorship to be successful at a, at a company level and to, and to roll it out. Uh, it applies usually in a design system you're establishing brand guidelines across multiple channels and expecting componentry to be used across all those channels for a consistent experience whereas with a component system it's part of you know a bigger organization's design system but you can also build a component system inside of itself without c-level sponsorship right you really just need the sponsorship or the buy-in of the people working on the site to build a component system you don't need to build a full-fledged design system with brand guidelines and all that and service multiple channels the, um, the componentry you build in a component system should have a, a common implementation pattern, right? They should all feel familiar. They, could all, they should all feel like they're built by one person so that as you're moving around in them and as you're working in them, it, it feels intuitive, it feels easy, it feel, it's understandable, you know what to expect. Um, and then the components in the system itself can be used atomically so they can be embedded in other components. They can be laid out on a page next to each other and the page will look okay. Um, they're generally built so that they work well with each other. And then importantly as well, you need to build the component system for everyone. If you just build it for developers, not, that's not sufficient. If you just build it for designers, that's not sufficient. Really, you have to remember that your audience is everybody. It's devs, authors, designers, stakeholders. Anybody that needs to understand what is possible with the component system needs to be addressed um, in how you build it and how you document it and how you present it to the business. So a couple of common aspects. Some of these you'll think are just kind of theme level stuff, and they are. But if you're building a component system, you also need consistency across the component system, not just within the theme itself. So like color palette, spacing, fonts, button styles, icons, animations, breakpoints, that's all kind of theming level stuff. But then we start getting into a bit more abstract or esoteric requirements, right? Like accessibility considerations. As presumably, if you have accessibility requirements, you want all of your components to be accessible in the same way. Um, if you're doing like an image, you want the alt tags, you want the area labels, all that stuff. If you have a, a theme that's light and dark, you want your components to respond to that correctly. Uh, you want your container size to be consistent so you get the nice straight vertical line down your site and everything lines up. Importantly, you want your authoring experience to be consistent, right? You don't want that to feel disjointed. You want them to go and author one component and for them to then go author another component and to feel the same. So that they're comfortable, they understand what's going to happen, they, they know that when they fill in this field, it's going to do what they expect it to do, and you don't, you don't have a bunch of different experiences form to form. And then stuff like CSS and JavaScript class names and attributes. Um, you want consistent naming styles, you want consistent patterns, just so that it's easy to go in and change it, easy to go in and read it and understand what's going on. Same with template structure and pre-processing uses. You kind of need to establish patterns for how you're going to use all the different options in Drupal so that people know where to look for how, how stuff is being built and how stuff is being changed. Because there's so many different paths between here's an entity form, here's a, a paragraph form, and here's it displayed on the front end that you need to narrow that down. You need to create um, a preferred path for all those development changes. So. Yep. So looking at a component, um, or looking at the previous component, we have the side-by-side -side component. And when you really break it down in a component system, what you're really looking at is probably four atoms on the, then build up the component, and then a couple component-specific fields. So in the red boxes, I've highlighted the atoms that I would probably build. You have a header, a description, a link, a media um, field. And then component-specific, everybody's always gonna ask, can I put the image on the left? Right? Even though the design showed on the right, they're going to ask, can the image be on the left? So you add that field. And then this is a wireframe, but there's a pretty good chance that the designers are going to say, well, we want to put a background color behind that text, right? We want to make it like a dark blue and the text be white. So you want to add that as well. So even though you're like, if you look at that, it looks like a simple component. It looks like it's all just flat fields, but it makes a lot more sense to build it out as atomically. Because um, when you look at 
just say the header right featured or new service it's not just text and it's not just an h2 element there's really three th three different things going on you have your text right you have what's actually going to be displayed but then having worked on a bunch of accessibility sites often the display value or the display style does not match that, the actual html element that is on the page because you want your headings to be to only decrease in size or to only move by one level and that can depend on the rest of the page so you need to be able to say this element's in H2 on this page, and this element's in H3 on this page to get your accessibility criteria met and your SEO criteria met, but for it to still look the same regardless of what the HTML element is. So even though like that just looks like a piece of text, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And then, like what happens when you stack through these together? How is this authored, right? How do you create this on a page? Is the left, right, left a pattern enforced? Is it limited to three? Is it a listing? Three of the previous components placed on a page by an author manually? Um, is it a new component with a repeating field set? And the fun answer is that there's no wrong answer to any of those questions. It's really how you want to build it. It's up to you to determine what is the correct pattern for your site and for your author and for your business. Um, and it could be a combination. Right. The, um, it's whatever you want to build. The important part is that in a component system, you want to take a step back and say, how are we going to author all instances of something like this? Not just how are we going to author this one instance? Because you want to apply the same patterns for other listings or for other groups of the same component, of a similar component. And it's really just important to establish the, the consistency and not do this part one way and then go to a different page and do it an entirely different way without a, a justified reason. All right. So that's roughly a component system, um, skipping ahead to what, it makes, what makes a component system successful or what I think makes a component su system successful. We touched on a little bit, you need buy-in from all users of the site. If you don't have buy-in from your developers, your designers, your authors, and your stakeholders, any one of them can slow down the process, make it more expensive, and may, might even cause complete failure. Um, so getting buy-in, that's the first step to success. After that is really building the system and thinking about build out of a site or initial creation of a site is a small fraction of the entire lifetime of the site. So you're building for the end user, you're not building for yourself. Yes, building a component system makes, makes it easier to get the, the site out the door and get it live, but in the long run, like that site's probably gonna be around for five years and you've worked on it for what, three, six, 12 months or something like that. Like that's a fraction of the total lifetime of the site you're not going to be working on that site forever. So you need to build your component system for the people who are going to use it every day, the authors, the marketers, the business stakeholders. But you also need to build it for future designers and future developers, people that are coming after you and working in this system you built. And just make sure that they have a good experience, so they can maintain the consistency that you've established. And then, yeah, as we touched on a bit, um, a consistent experience is also extremely important. So from the designs, the componentry needs to make sense with each other. They want patterns and rules and similar containers and breakpoints. You want all that consistency. From an authoring perspective, as we said, we want the forms to feel the same. We want field naming, field structures, um, field help text to kind of feel very similar, written by one person. And like it's all part of a, a bigger system and not disjointed component to component. And then development, we want to be using the same development patterns component to component and not be using everything Drupal has available to us, but the subset of functionality that we've decided is important to this component system and how we're going to build components in Drupal. A couple other things. Uh, the goal of a component system is to lower the barrier to entry. If you have a choice between making an obvious or choosing an obvious solution and a clever solution, always choose the obvious one. Because the developer coming in after you is going to wonder why you didn't do the obvious way, because they're probably not going to understand the clever way. Um, so yeah, the, the obvious solution is almost always the better solution, even if it's a little bit more code, a little bit more of an in-depth or process um, over a one-liner or some, some clever uses of a Drupal system that not a lot of people understand. Uh, use standard approaches over Drupalisms. So it's a lot easier to onboard a developer like a front-end developer who doesn't have Drupal experience if, you, if your code isn't scattered with Drupalisms, right? If you don't have a bunch of twig-tweak, if you don't have a bunch of pre-processing, 
if you're kind of sticking to normal HTML standards, normal CSS, normal JavaScript, that's a lot easier for them to come on board and feel comfortable with, oh, this all looks familiar to me, with it, familiar to me and I understand what's going on here. That all makes sense. Um, and it actively address implicit or institutional, institutional knowledge buildup. So when you're, when you're working on stuff, when you're building stuff, there's a level of knowledge you obtain by building it. And if you don't write it down, if you don't make it, make it explicit, it becomes only knowledge you have and you become the knowledge repository for that information. And then when you try to bring somebody else on board, whether it's an author, a developer, a designer, you have to share that information out of your head, assuming you're still around to share it. And that's a, a communication channel that doesn't need to exist, right? So if there's a standard, if there's a practice, you need to, to make it explicit instead of implicit, right? And that, that really helps the, the longevity of a system because you start establishing stuff that, you, like you, you just start writing your onboarding documentation and you, there's a lot less meeting time needed to bring somebody up on board and up to speed. And then finally, um, discoverability. So this is a big one and it's really, really hard in Drupal, but a living style guide makes a component system so much more useful. And the difficult part is that you need 100% of all your functionality represented in that style guide. If you have 50%, if you have 70%, even if you have 90%, that's not enough. Eventually people will say, well, Drupal is the real source of truth there. I have to log into Drupal to understand what's really, what's really gonna happen. Um, so yeah, you need, like, it needs to be 100% accurate. There needs to be no differences between your style guide and your Drupal site. Otherwise people will just say, Drupal is the real source of truth. I'm gonna log into Drupal and that's the only way I can check what's actually gonna happen. Um, and to facilitate that, you need to pick an approach or a process where the easiest path of development is through the style guide. Because if your developers need to build in Drupal and then build in your style guide, they're not gonna do that second part. Um, they're gonna run out of time and say they'll do it later, and then nobody ever does, or they don't fully build it out in the style guide, and then you have incomplete documentation, and like I said, people just default back to Drupal to see what's really possible. All right, so those are a couple of the things that I think make a component system successful. Moving on to, you know, that all sounds great. I want a component system, now what? There's two real big choices you have to make, component usage and component architecture, and we'll walk through both of them. Um, I'm not sure if component usage is the best term, but I couldn't think of a better one. So it might be a component approach, component implementation. Uh, we look through component usage, and there, there's really four. Um, it comes down to coupled, decoupled, headless, and monolithic approaches. And this is a high level of how you're gonna build things in Drupal, how you're, gonna, how you're gonna approach the problem of creating standards and creating best practices for your component system. So the first one, looking at coupled, this is your traditional Drupal approach. It's built in and with Drupal. It's dependent on the Drupal render, it's dependent on Drupal to render correctly and fully. Um, usually there's extensive usage of Drupal Drupal's templating override system, um, as well as pre-processing, and twig tweak, twig filter, stuff like that. A bunch, of stuff, a bunch of the helpers that Drupal provides are usually baked into this type of approach. When you're thinking about these type of approaches, there's paragraphs, layout builder, nodes, blocks, terms, view modes, stuff like that. Um, then we move on to decoupled, or since decoupled is kind of a loaded term, I like independent as well, because you're not really decoupling from Drupal, it's more of a, a design or a, a pattern for using less Drupal in your Drupal templates. Uh, components are created independently of Drupal and there's minimal or no Drupal Drupalisms in your templates. This, like I said, it lowers the barrier to entry when you're bringing on front-end developers who don't know Drupal because there's just less Drupal they need to understand to work in the system. Templates are intended for use in systems other than the Drupal. This one's optional, but if you have multiple different PHP applications or multiple different Drupal sites, it can be useful to, the more Drupal you pull out of your templates, the easier it is to reuse that Twig template somewhere else. Um, or if you're doing web components or React components or something like that, that is also key to not have any Drupalisms in there, so, Drupalisms in there so you can use them somewhere else. It also makes it a lot easier to integrate them into Storybook or Pattern Lab or another style guide system. And importantly, with a decoupled approach, uh, developers may create components outside of Drupal first 
and then integrate them back into Drupal when they're done. So that's a, a pretty big developer flow change, whereas with Coupled, you have to create the entity, create the form, essentially have it all configured as far as the content architecture goes, and then you can style it. With Decoupled, you could create the component and then backfill in the content architecture in Drupal and connect the two. Um, some examples of this are Emulsify, Outline, Particle, Wingsuit. Um, if you're not familiar with these, they're fine. I found that most agencies are now open sourcing their, their component approaches, but they're not getting a lot of adoption outside of the agency itself. So it's interesting to see what's out there, but the, there doesn't seem to be a, the community rallying behind one or the other. So then we get into headless. I'm not going to talk about this a bunch. Um, components defined and rendered are rendered outside of Drupal. Drupal only is only used as a content store, and it really introduces a whole new fun set of problems um, that you could do multiple, many, many hours of sessions on. So we're going to skip over this one. Some examples of this, if you are using it, are Gatsby, Next.js, Druxt. And then you have your, your monolithic approaches. So these are typically opinionated systems that are built on top of a, a coupled approach. So they're, they're built, in, built or baked into Drupal in some way, but they have opinions about how to do Drupal, and they often have a bunch of custom code, a bunch of um, admin theme adjustments, a bunch of patterns already in place to move things along to speed you up. Uh, the two exceptions to this are Gutenberg and Acquia Site Studio, which really integrate a custom solution into Drupal itself so if you haven't used either, they, they both took the route of building um, a custom component builder system and then with JavaScript or React and then integrating that into Drupal to store the content that those component systems uh, collect. And then you have stuff like uh, Drop Solid, Rocket Ship, Rain, and Pattern Kit, which, uh, yes, I added Pattern Kit just because we were talking about it last night, um, that are more Drupal, built into Drupal, but have opinions about how you're doing Drupal and to kind of leave those systems can be difficult sometimes, right? They're making choices for you about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So those are the four kind of big component usage patterns that you need to decide on. I personally prefer decoupled. I think it directs a nice balance between allowing, getting the power of Drupal while also um, not being too dependent on Drupal's helpers. So that, that's the one I usually default to. Uh, then we go into the, the component architectures, common component architectures. So the two big ones we're going to talk about are paragraphs and layout builder because they are the, the two big options in the underlying um, architectures for pretty much every other, every other system you'll see. So getting into paragraphs, we're going to revisit the side-by-side -side component that's for atoms, the header, description, link, media, our media left and right, and our background color. So I'm going to have a little bit of code here. Um, I apologize if it's small or hard to read. It's not super important, but I just wanted to get the complexity on the screen. So first, we have a left-right part of this component. Um, and at the end of all the code, you'll see this code would be repeated, right? So you have your, your div with your left side and your div with your right side, and you're doing a conditional what, what content goes on the left and what content goes on the right. Is it the media or is it the actual like, text? So that would be included at the end of all these templates. Um, the first approach we can look at is a couple nested paragraphs approach. I cannot stress this enough. Do not do this. Um, there are serious performance and revisioning issues that will take down your site at some point in the future. But it is included here because it is the most logical way to use paragraphs. And a lot of people have done it in the past. And I really hope this gets addressed at some point so we can do this. Um, and I wanted to show like how, how it's nice to do it this way, even though there are performance issues, but I cannot stress it enough. Do not nest your paragraphs. Um, so yeah, so if, you're nest, if, you, if we could do this, this is what your template for that component looks like. It's fairly clean. Um, you have a, a set media with your field media for your free media paragraph. You have your set content with a header, description, and button paragraph. That's fairly easy to, to understand. Or is it, right? Um, when you look into it, there's a bunch of questions here. This doesn't actually tell you what's happening. It tells you that you're rendering media, header, description, and button. But you have no idea what's rendering. It's all, it's all dependent on configuration outside of this file. So if we take a look at just the field header, 
Um, there's the nested entity reference to another paragraph, once again. Do not do that. Don't ever do that um, until we fix the revisioning issue that blows up the database. But when we're looking at that, what it's really saying is render, Drupal saying render a template. The question is which template? And because of Drupal's templating override system, there's six possible choices by default. At a minimum, you need to figure out which template is actually being rendered when you see field, field header in that file. So you got, and they, um, they get more specific, right? You start with field, and then you end up with field entity type field name bundle. So the choices are awesome. It's not awesome to navigate that and figure out which one is actually being used. And yes, I know you can turn on debugging and your HTML will tell you, but that requires that you get your Drupal local up and running, turn on development services, load up the page where it's on, and then look in the HTML, right? That's just not very convenient if you want to quickly understand what's going on. And a little bit more. Um, so which templates does that template include, right? Because we were just talking about the first one, but the field header itself is also going to have fields in it who are also going to have six possible template values. And then you have to go track those down. Um, which preprocess functions are running? Because every, every template suggestion is also a valid preprocess suggestion. So there's six possible ones you, can, you need to check for for that field, and then six ones for every field on that paragraph itself as well. Um, so yeah, you multiply the number of possible template and preprocess functions to check for just at the top level by four, right? So that's 24 possible templates, 24 possible preprocess functions. And those preprocess functions can be spread across custom modules, across the theme, like they can just be anywhere. Um, and it's not very common, but like you can also get preprocess functions in the contrib modules. So the, it's just very hard to track down all the code that's actually running on your component. The next approach is decoupled-ish. So this is um, reused fields. So instead of nesting paragraphs, you have fields that you've defined, like a field header text, field header button, field header, et cetera. Um, and you add them to the, to the paragraph itself. So you're not nesting paragraphs, but you do have the same set of fields used component to component to component. So if you look at the template for that, Immediately, like this, this looks a lot more complicated, but it also gives you a lot more information, right? Because you're including the, the templates for the atoms directly, you know where to go look, you know what's happening in this file and what's being rendered in that, in that variable. Uh, and then if we look at the header itself, there we go, we can see that we're setting a text variable to the value from the header text field display from the display value field and element from the element value. So you're, you're bypassing all of those preprocess functions for each of those individual fields because you're calling the values directly, um, as well as bypassing the template is, templates, like I said. So this really flattens out what's possible or what Drupal is going to try and run on your code. It makes it so you really don't have to worry about the preprocessing and the template suggestions for the paragraph entity itself not for all the possible ones for the fields. And then you do that for each, each template, and it, it moves along. Uh, so some benefits of this, like I said, the templates in use are explicitly stated. A front-end developer can go in and see these four templates are in use. They can then go track them down and see what they're actually doing. We reduce the number of possible template and preprocessing functions to the ones for the entity only. Um, some downsides. There's no way to embed the atom forms, right? You're, you're kind of building the same field collection over and over in each of your paragraphs. And that becomes a pain, and it's hard to be consistent that way because you you have to configure them all individually. If you want to change the form look and feel for a header, you have to go track it down in all those paragraphs and make the change a bunch of times. Um, it also removes the ability for processing logic for um, the group of atom fields, right? So you have your header text, header, header element, header display fields. They're not in any way grouped together. So if you want logic that runs on those three sets of fields on every component, you can't really do that without a specific custom pattern that says call this method in the paragraph preprocessing function. You can't, you can't attach it to the template in any way or attach it to the, the component in any way without custom patterns. And then you have to dig values out in Twig, which is a real pain. How many people have tried to dig out the, the URL for an image? Um, 
or the URL for a link. Yeah, it's it's not fun. So that's decoupled-ish. Moving to the kind of the next step, you get decoupled, and immediately this is a lot prettier to look at. Um, and you'll notice that there's there's no Drupalisms in here, right? It's just a bunch of um, template includes with a bunch of variables being passed to templates individually. And this is kind of my ideal state for a template because it's not doing any data manipulation, it's not doing any data structure changes, it's just using the values passed to it to render them in the order and the structure that, the HTML structure that you want. So this is kind of the data structure you would expect to see for that template. It would be an array with background color, media position, and then you'd have media header, description, and button as arrays with values itself. And you just pass those to the templates um, and define in, well, look at the template to figure out the structure that it expects to pass the data into. So some benefits of that, that, that one is clean and easy to read. It's very easy to say these are the templates in use, these are the values we're passing to it, Everything else is just done somewhere else, and I can track that down. Um, the data is prepped and ready for each template, so we're not depending on Drupal's field data structure and what comes from that process. We're saying we just want to we want to pull out the information we need and structure it in a way we know, and then pass that to the templates, and not pass everything Drupal provides at the render layer. Uh, and then the same benefits from the decoupled dish approach. We have templates that are used um, and explicitly stated, and we've reduced the number of possible pre-processing and template suggestions to just the ones for the entity or for the paragraph. Some downsides, um, getting that clean data structure is done with extensive pre-processing, and that it's not coupled to the templates itself, so you kind of need that same pre-processing for header, for the header fields across all your components, or you need to create a function that does that and call it in your paragraph pre-processing. It's, it's a bit of a pain, um, and the downside is that makes you kind of dependent on a full stack or a Drupal front-end developer, because a normal front-end developer doesn't know PHP. They're not going to be able to write a pre-processing function. They're not going to be able to dig the, the data out of Drupal and PHP, so your, your component implementation starts to be dependent on back-end developers, which is a bottleneck usually, or an additional team member that you need just to get your front-end done. Uh, there's no way to embed the atom forms, like I was saying. You, you're adding fields individually to the paragraph. Um, and then, yeah, the same other downsides to the decoupled approach. Processing logic can't be grouped and packaged with the template, and you have to dig values out of Twig. So those are kind of the, the three main approaches I've seen to paragraphs. I'm sure there's, uh, there are others. Um, if you have one that seems very different, I would like to know about it so I can add it into this presentation. But I, I think this covers most approaches, even if they're mix and matching the various different ways they're doing it. Because like, you don't have to strictly do all these. You can mix and match the different approaches based on the situation. To me, that's just a lot messier. I would much rather pick one and stick to it across everything. So moving on to Layout Builder. Um, there's two ways to do Layout Builder. The first one is with custom blocks. Custom blocks are just entities, so see everything we just said about paragraphs. It all applies. The other one, oh, where'd I go? Is custom blocks? Yep. Oh, these are in the wrong order. So the other one is inline blocks. Um, this is when you click Add Block in, in Layout Builder, and the sidebar pops up, you have the Add Custom Block option, and those are content entities that are defined as custom blocks in the block layout section of the site. Um, or sorry, the block structure of this area of the site. And then you have inline blocks. Those are the ones that appear immediately in the sidebar without having to click, click Custom Blocks. And they're, they're actual Drupal blocks, right? They're defined by the plugin system, and they don't use field API. The forms are built using form API, um, so they're built programmatically. You're once again dependent on a backend developer, um, which is both a con and a, a benefit. It's a lot easier to 
get the data structure you want from Form API, but you need a backend developer and you need to understand Form API, which can be a challenge. Um, the values are easier to access. Form API doesn't do as much nesting or as much, um, yeah, it's just not as deep. The values are a lot more immediately available. And you usually don't have to traverse as many levels to get what you want out of it. Um, and another benefit is that the blocks in, the, in Drupal have a build method, and that's kind of a default error to do pre-processing. You don't really have to depend on a, a pre-processing function. Your block class has a method in it where you can do all your pre-processing, and it's all going to be in one place, and it's all going to be with the definition of the block itself. So the slides that I had here, like these are the, this is the same decoupled template that we were seeing in paragraphs, and it could work for inline blocks too. It's the same data structure. It's just a different way to get there with inline blocks. All right, so that was 40 minutes of preamble. Now we get to the fun part. Why are components difficult? We might run a little bit over here. Um, before we get to the, the interesting answer, there's one that I wanted to call out, which is we have an illusion of choice, right? I listed out 10 different approaches when we were talking about um, couple, decouple, headless, monolithic. There's a bunch of different options that people have created. But when you look at it, they're all under, they all depend on the same underlying systems and they all have to make the same choices for compromises and trade-offs. And when you really start looking at it, when you choose one of those, you're just agreeing to that approach and the trade-offs they made. But at the end of the day, I don't think the underlying systems in Drupal are capable of really creating a component structure that we can effectively use. And by effective, I mean being able to create a component that doesn't require significant backend development, right? A front-end developer can come in and create a simple component, and they don't need to understand PHP. They don't need to track down pre-processing functions. They don't need to create a block class, stuff like that. They should just be able to come in and create a component and be done with their front-end skills. So the illusion of choice, I think, for me, that the underlying systems not being able to support a component structure is why we're seeing a proliferation of agencies open sourcing their approaches because they've made decisions and trade-offs that they feel is appropriate or beneficial to how they do Drupal, but we're not seeing any co we're not seeing co like those coalescing or um, combining together to bring really move components forward because the systems they're building on just aren't capable of doing it a better way. It's just all a bunch of trade-offs that we have to make. So that's the illusion of choice. The other one, um, probably the big one, is that a component's complexity in Drupal is not correlated to the complexity of the component itself, right? If you have a component that's a text field, a select field, an image field, that's not exactly simple to click together and build in Drupal, but a front-end developer could knock that out in, what, 30 minutes, a couple hours? So that's a big one. The whole dependency on the Drupal knowledge, the Drupal backend knowledge, how Drupal works, it's just, it's a huge bottleneck to building a component system and truly understanding it, exposing it, um, and just moving rapidly through component development. So because it's not possible to effectively model a component system structure in Drupal using content entities, paragraphs, layout builder, what ends up happening is you need, a, you need that glue layer that we were just talking about, that pre-processing layer that Require, that does data retrieval and pre-processing, and it requires Drupal and PHP knowledge. And that takes your, your front-end developer and it turns them into having to be a Drupal front-end developer or a full-stack Drupal developer. Or you need a combination of a back-end developer and a front-end developer to get a component out the door. Um, yeah, so front-end implementation and maintenance ends up being dependent on full-stack or back-end developer skills, and that just creates an additional communication channel, creates an additional ticket that needs to be worked, creates an additional dependency and that adds to the complexity and the difficulty of getting components done. Um, and that glue layer, so we talked about pre-process hooks, but to me that's also twig filters and functions. Um, to me, I'm starting to consider twig tweak and extens excessive usage of it as a code smell because it's, it's starting to say that Drupal is failing as a content repository to deliver data that is useful to the template. So instead we have to run a bunch of PHP code in the template to get the data we actually want. Um, so yeah, that, that glue layer is the pre-process hooks, but it can also be a bunch of twig tweak functions in your template itself. 
Because once again, just a normal front-end developer is not going to know what that function does. It's, they're not going to, they might not even know the one they need exists. So it creates a barrier to entry for people who don't or aren't highly skilled Drupal front-end developers. And because that glue um, is the stuff that couples a component form to its template and is spread through all Drupal, it's difficult to consistently use the same approaches. The same, the, this, use the same approaches to creating that, that glue layer or that manipulation layer. Um, and then as we saw, it's like, it's difficult to find and understand all the moving pieces and everything that's effect, affecting the component renders um, output. And then it's also diffi difficult to explicitly document, right? If you don't know everything that's running, how can you write it down? And if everything that's running can change based on one method and in, um, introduction, that's just more documentation you have to write and you have to manually create that. There's no automated way to dig that out. And then it also makes it very difficult to create a living style guide outside of Drupal because you're dependent on Drupal's render layer to actually manipulate everything to actually get your front end out, um, a correct representation of your front end. And then eventually what that causes is that the system eventually becomes intractable for authors, developers, and designers. Um, authors eventually will start sneaking in as invalid authoring configurations, and then that causes instability in the system, right? If they can author content that breaks a component, they are gonna have less and less confidence in their component system and less and less confidence that they're gonna get what they expect when they create a component. Um, developers are gonna get overwhelmed by the number of options they have and what is the correct way to approach this problem. And designers are gonna have a hard problem grasping what exists so that they can extend it or that they can add on an additional part of the site now that you know the full site's been built. And then instead of extending something simple, they're just gonna create something new and it's gonna be on the developers to implement, implement that new um, design on top of components that might already exist and now you end up with duplicates. So it, it eventually just, it becomes intractable for everybody, whether because of size or age. And then that creates a high barrier to development. Um, as we've touched on, during build, implementation becomes dependent on Drupal backend skills and then after you're done building, you still need those backend skills to maintain your components but you also are dependent on the implicit knowledge of how the glue layer was built. So it just becomes a whole, a whole thing to understand how, how your system is working and it requires a lot of onboarding and ramp up time to really become efficient in the system you've built. All right, so we are out of time. Um, I will try to speed through this. So what can we do to make it easier? One, a one page form editor would be great there's currently like seven different areas where you can change fields in Drupal. Um, and it's, they're not laid out terribly, but that's seven places you have to go look to understand the full configuration of a field. And that's kind of annoying. Um, we can make embedding entities performant and not an issue so that we can actually nest paragraphs. That would be awesome. I know people are working on that. Um, we can make managing forms with embedded forms easier. So when you're embedding a paragraph inside a paragraph, you now have two times the number of places you need to check, and you need to go figure out where that form is on the site so you can actually see how it renders. So getting like a live preview of a form would be awesome. Having a one-page form editor would be awesome. Um, another one, and one I think I think I might start trying out soon is a field formatter type that just returns process data. So right now, field formatters return render arrays and return something that's expected to be rendered, but I never use it that way. Like I just want the data. So why, don't, why doesn't a field formatter just return data in a structure I understand and it in the structure I want? So that's one I'm gonna be trying out soon. And then the easy one, um, when you go to add a, an existing field on a content type, why doesn't it tell you anything about that field? It just gives you the name and the machine name. But there's a bunch of settings that go along that, with that. So like, why isn't that information there so I know that I'm putting the right field on the content type? That seems like a very easy thing to fix. Um, form API. Stop using render arrays and move to OOP elements. Um, render arrays are the, like the last part of Drupal that are still using arrays exclusively. And it's about time we, we update that. Uh, improve documentation. In my opinion, Form API is currently over documented. We have Drupal 6, 7, 8, and 9 versions of Form API questions and documentation out there. Um, and the confusion between a render array and a form element just adds to that inability to figure out what is the right 
property or the right array key you have to add to get what you want out um, on the form. And then make decoupled JavaScript elements easier. It's hard to get the classes and structures to match styling um, if you're doing a decoupled JavaScript field. And then some things just aren't possible. You can't create a JavaScript version of the entity reference autocomplete because uh, Drupal doesn't expose the autocomplete handlers through an API endpoint. And then a big one, I, I think there's room for like a new entity type specifically for components. I would love to see some, some representation or some version of this as a component in Drupal and then start building on top of that instead of saying you need to figure out with content entities because I don't think content entities are suited for the job. Um, you need to store data. To me, a component entity would store data in place and serialize it a lot like Layout Builder does. Um, instead of using field API and storing it in individual tables. And then I'd love to see it declaratively, like a declarative way to describe the data structure and pre-processing that needs to go on in that component instead of it being reactionary in the pre-process functions. And then form API based instead of field APIs. I almost prefer working form API right now instead of field API because I can just write all the code and I can read it. So that, those are just some thoughts. Um, we'll skip forward to questions. I was going to tell you how I'm solving this problem, which I'm sure will be a question. But we are out of time. So yeah, that is why components are difficult in Drupal. Well, how are you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the number one is planning. Um, as I said, I've recognized that component build outs are dependent on back end developer skills. So before even sprint planning, I'm making sure that my products are resourced correctly with the correct amount of back end developer hours compared to our front end developer hours. And then in sprint planning, it's getting things, getting the back end built so that our front end developers can work efficiently and not really have to worry about the Drupal part of it. Um, it's a lot of juggling and there's a lot of thought that has to go into how you're working things and who can work on what and it's kind of a pain but that's the best solution I found right now it's just like you got to acknowledge that to build a component it requires a, a certain amount of Drupal knowledge a certain amount of back-end knowledge and there's only so many resources on your team that can do that so have them focus on the stuff that only they can do and then have the front-end developers do the front-end part so there's that We've been doing a lot of Aqueous Light Studio recently too, um, which is an awesome tool. It does kind of alleviate that problem a little bit, but doesn't alleviate all of the Drupal knowledge problems. So, I don't know. It, it has its own issues, but not quite the same ones I've talked about in this talk. And then being a developer, um, if you're not familiar with this XKCD strip, when you see a problem as a developer, you're like, why doesn't somebody just build the correct solution? And then we can get rid of all these other solutions. And then you end up with 15 solutions instead of 14. So I've built a module called um, RJSF, which is built around a React JSON schema form. And if you're not familiar with JSON schema, it's a way to define primitive um, data structures in JSON. And then React JSON schema form, the JavaScript library, will build a form based on that data structure that you've defined. So what that allows us to do is it kind of moves the, it allows me to bypass form API and field API really, and define our component data structures in JavaScript files. And then we run it through a build process um, that only flattens all that, all the component inheritance out to a flat JSON file that is interpreted by Drupal to render the form. Um, and then yeah, the forms are in React, so there's a better UX and it's an easier skill set to staff for if you want to build a custom form widget. Um, and you get access to the entirety of the React ecosystem. So there's quite a few benefits to kind of Bypassing form API, and I say bypassing, but this React form is ultimately embedded back into the into form API and into Drupal. Um, Drupal just doesn't actually control the rendering of the fields. So that's how I'm solving it. You mentioned uh, story code. Yeah. Story on that one slide. Yeah. Um, so using RJSF and some of the tools you're using, is that is that what you're using for your living style guide? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Storybook. Um, I think the jury's out on that one. Pattern Lab has has lost. Um, yeah. Just like Storybook, I think is like 10 million downloads a month or something like that, and it, it seems to be adopted by the wider community at this point. So there's just a bunch of support for it. So Storybook is what we're using for our living style guide, and certainly decoupling our, our data structure from Drupal helps us 
more easily expose that data structure into Storybook because Storybook is written. I'm pretty sure it's is it React? I think it's React. It's React. Yeah. Um, so it's all JavaScript based. And then yeah. So thanks. If you want to talk more, you can track me down at the socials or at camp. Um, I am Control Adel on D.O and Slack. And there's the link to the slides again. <laughs> Last call for questions before I press the button. Yep. You mentioned that Drupal doesn't provide a system. Do you follow other frameworks that you think do it better or to learn off of, like, layer of that is, like, inertia and sort of what's in that? Um, so the question just for the recording was if I've looked at other platforms and other systems to see if they're doing it a different way or if they're doing it better. Not closely. I've been, most of my job is Drupal. Um, I've been looking into Gutenberg since there's that integration. And I'm not totally satisfied with their approach for that. So I probably do need to go look and see what else is out there. But at the same time, I, there's not a lot of CMS systems that are as comprehensive as Drupal itself, so I'm not expecting to find something that's <laughs> as built out or as thought out um, as what's available in a proper CMS. Yeah. So like you said, the, the structure, you know, once you get it, it's hard to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So how do you go like before abstracting? Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the recording here.